Hello, I'm Chuan Fu, and today I would like to talk about uh, transmission electron microscopy. So in our previous class, we have talked about the scanning probe microscopy and also scanning electron microscopy. And here's the, uh, the one we are going to talk about, the transmission electron microscopy, which is the oldest machine for nanotechnology characterization. It was invented in 1930, and was uh, the, this technique is mature in 1950. And there is there was an, a lot of improvement in resolution of transmission electron microscopy. So, um, but it is very useful too, and we have very strong facility in the NIST lab in in downstairs in this building. So we have several of this machine, and it's useful. So here's the reference I. I use uh, mostly, and it's a strong recommendation for you to, to read it. It's very easy to read by Williams and Carter and about the detail of this electron microscopy. And here's the basic uh, setup component for in TM, or we call it TM. So there are three parts. The first part is the illumination system, uh, which include the electron gun on the top, and there are several conden condenser lenses. And the main purpose of this uh, first illumination system is used to uh, try to give a coherent uh, electron source. So you can make it uh, uh, interact with the spaceman by a parallel beam or a convergent beam. So in, mo uh, in the two basic or main function of TN, we use parallel beam to get TN images or, or get the diffraction pattern. But you can also use a convergent beam, which you can uh, analyze or measure the composition of the sample, or you can measure the chemical property of the sample. And you, it often called STM, X-ray, and spectroscopy. And there's a second part of the TM, which is a very small part, about 10 uh, or centimeter deep. And it is about called the objective lenses and stage. So in, include the objective lenses and objective aperture. It is very small, but it is very important. So it's called the heart of the TEM. Basically, in this area, in this part of the machine, you, you uh, generate the images of the, uh, of the spaceman. And the third part, part there are many lenses called, uh, there are intermediate lens, diffraction lens, and projector lens. And the main purpose of those lenses are magnifying the, the image to a million uh, time of magnifications. So here are, then let's talk about the resolution. What's the resolution of TEM? If we know a little bit of optic microscope, that the first expression here, the resolution is 0.61 lambda divided by mu sine beta. beta. This is the Rayleigh criterion. Basically, the, the resolution is related to the wavelengths of the source. So in visible light, we have the light source like a four, four, 400 nanometer. So we typically have the sub-micron resolution for the optical microscope. But so now it, it, for electron, now we are not using a visible light. We are using electron. Then what's the wavelength of electron? This is a De Broglie uh, expression of the wavelength of electron. It's dependent uh, inverse of uh, square root of uh, electrons. So for example, 100 kV electron, we can have a lambda of the wavelength of electron is 4 picoamp, which is 0.04 angstrom. If 3 angstrom is a, a, an atom, it's much, much hun one of hundredth smaller than uh, the atom. So you could have a lot better uh, resolution than, than, than uh, resolve uh, one atom. But could we get the really sub angstrom resolution? It's very hard, and we still are working on the resolution uh, closer to angstrom. So the machine downstairs in this have a, a machine have two angstrom uh, resolution, one the other have a uh, 1.4 angstrom resolution. We we cannot get the sub angstrom resolution. Even we have a very strong, uh, well, we have very small uh, wavelength of the electron. Why is that? Think about it. And we can go from 100 kV to 1 mega V, with 1,000 kV. And we can have a 0.01 angstrom of wavelength of electron. So 
but we still we don't have a lot of improvement in the resolution. So here I show you the very high voltage electron microscopy built by uh, Joel in, in Japan. And here are three floor height, and you can generate the electron source, the energy of 1.225 mega electron volt. But the resolution is not improved a lot. In, it's not improved uh, further to sub intron in this machine. So what limit the resolution of TEM now is the we, we need to know. Um, basically, do you, if you think about the optic microscope, wavelength is one basic rule uh, factor of uh, limiting the resolution. And do do anybody know which is the other? What, what limit the resolution of the microscope? Typically, what? Atom? The material, sometimes, right? But, 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 one practical thing is that we cannot make perfect lens. If we can make perfect lenses, we can have a resolution probably close to the theoretical resolution, because we don't, we cannot make a perfect lenses. So we have aberration. So basically, two aberration. One is chromat uh, spherical aberration, and the other chromatic aberration. The spherical aberration is that. We cannot make a perfect parabolic uh, shape that can converge the, the light or the electron to one single focal point. So we only make a spherical uh, lenses. And here, there's no real lenses. They are all magnetic lenses. But we still cannot make a, a perfect lenses. So we will have a spherical aberration corresponding to the co coefficient times the limiting angle. So the more you off the optical axis, the serious you, you get the aberrations. And there is a chromatic aber aberration, which you, you, if you have different wavelength of light, and now it's the different energy of uh, electron, then you get different refraction from the lenses. But here, in, because we are talking about very thin sample, about 100 nanometers. So in TM, this is not a major effect. The major effect reduce the resolution is the aberration, um, spherical aberrations. So here, I, I, we simply calculate the, what's the resolution of. If they, the two factors are independent, we can use a quadrature, quadrature dependent. This resolution uh, is, we can, so, so if there are these two factors are independent, we use a quadrature uh, uh, expression of that. So this is a theoretical, which is a diffraction limited of resolution. The other is a spherical uh, aberration limited of the spherical aberration resolution. So here we talk about in the Rayleigh criterion, this is uh, related to a lambda divided by the limiting angle. Okay. And this RP SPH I wrote, wrote right there, right, right on the slice as well, is uh, is proportional to C, the coefficient of spherical uh, aberration, and time the third power of the limiting angle. So okay, so we substitute these two uh, dependent on, on on the beta. Uh, in this I expression, and we want to get the minima, the optimized limiting angle. So we, in order to get limit minima, we take the first derivative of beta to equal zero. So you know of that. So fr from the expression here, the uh, two power in 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 the denominator become the third power, and this sixth power, if you first take the first derivative, become the fifth power. So so now we get the optimi optimized limiting angle, and we substitute back in this fraction. So we can get the minima resolution, or practical minima resolution of the TEM in this form, depend on the coefficient of spherical aberration and also of the wavelengths. So for example, if you only in improve the, uh, re increase the energy of the electron, you can only improve the resolution from 2.8 angstrom to, to 2.1 angstrom. Okay, but if you increase the or you reduce the uh, spherical co uh, aberration coefficient here, 
from 2 to 0.5, which this is the one which we have in our NIST uh, lab downstairs, we can improve to 1.4 uh, angstrom of resolution. But, but now, nowadays, if you want to improve even more, you spend a lot. If you want to re improve like a sub instrument, you, you probably will cost like uh, one or two million to, to get some uh, set up to correct the co uh, spherical aberrations. Okay, so before getting an image, you need to know what's the limitation of the TM. You only can scan a very tiny, small spot or, or area of the sample. So it, you can not only use TM as your own tool. You should use TM with the uh, other visible light or optical microscope and the SEM because uh, the sampling problem, you, you only look at a very small, tiny area. So if, in order to get a better idea of what your material is, you need to use as uh, with uh, the other tools. And the other is uh, how to interpreting uh, how to interpret the transmission, uh, the image from TEM. What do we see here? Do you have any idea? Two rhinos, or one rhinos with two heads, two rhinos, then what happened here? Because we see 2D image from the 3D, 3D sample. So if you lo look at the 3D sample here, this is a material, but what, what you look at is looking down from it. So you, you merge the 3D column into one flat Im into one image. So so the 3D materi uh, material you only get one two uh, D images. So sometime it will confuse you uh, to to interpret it. Like here is a dislocation in the material we often see by TM. Okay, some people say oh this line uh, along the disorientation of the uh, of this dislocation and some of lie in the other orientation, but that's not true. It often there are some because this is two D image. It often there is some dislocation incline in some angle across the material, but but in the image you only see something like a projection. You only see a projection. So that is not. So you, you should learn a little bit about how to interpret the TEM image, but this is the limitation. So you should be careful when, when you get the image. Okay, the third thing is very, people always know that TEM is, is very useful and helpful, but it is very time consuming to prepare a TEM sample because you want to, the electron to transmit from the, T, the, the sample to get the transmit electrons. So you need to make very thin sample. And Typically, thinner, better. Thinner is the better. And thinner, you get better resolution. So typically, if you want to get a high resolution TEM, you want to reduce the sample thickness to 50 nanometers. That is very challenging. So we will talk about more sample prep in the next class. Probably, probably no. Yeah, because you want... You, at least you want to uh, thinner than one micron. So in any case, you want to trans transmit from. If you, I don't use TN. Yeah, you can use. Yeah, okay, we will talk about that. Look, about to answer your question here. Okay, let me skip. Okay, here's a sample specimen. So there's an electron beam from the top. And there are many, many, many other information can come from the interaction between the electron and the sample. You can get the backscattering electron. You can get a secondary electron. Uh, okay, you can get the all J electron. Uh, there are different meaning. Uh, probably I will show you next time what, what are these different. And you can get also the X-ray to do the analysis, but that all the all, all information are the back scattering information, and there are some forward scattering. Uh, there are the transmitted electron and diffraction electron. So in the SCM, we talk about we have very thick sample. We don't prepare the sample, and we cannot get this two image uh, information from the sample. We can only get the back scattering information from the sample. But with the end, in order to get this two information, you should make 
simple as thin as possible to let the electron transmit from it. Okay, so now let's go back to talk about the electron source. This is very important. This the electron source are uh, the beginning of, of getting the image. So there are two type thermionic source, which are tungsten and lap six lithium uh, hexa boronite, and there are few emission source. Okay. So the thermionic source are, are controlled by the Richardson law. Okay, so the current density is proportional to the square of the te temperature and the exponential depending of the work function. The phi is the work function there. So higher melting point is important. So that's why we choose tungsten. You need to raise the higher temperature uh, so to have the more uh, current density. And also the lab six we use because you have a small a uh, small number of uh, work functions. Okay, so, <clears throat> but nowadays we are using more and more about fuel emission. We don't want to heat up because when you heat up, you probably generate some uh, thermal fluctuation that will reduce your uh, monochromatic uh, source. So we use co uh, fuel emission source. <clears throat> okay, so here the work function for lab six is 2.4 for tungsten is 4.5, so you saw in, in the exponential dependence, so that improves a lot of current density. And the cold field emission source is, is very good, but it requires very high purity, high vacuum uh, uh, system. So that means high vacuum system means expensive uh, setup for, for tools. Okay, so let, let me, so here are the two basic uh, basic uh, main function we use for, for TEM. Okay, so if you're complicated, so let me si uh, simplify a little bit. Okay, so one is diffraction pattern, one get the image. So let, let's from the, remind you the optics one-to-one lessons. Like, here's the lenses, here's the optic axis. Okay, if you have a parallel beam from the infinite, Okay, you will converge in the focal length of focal focal point, right? So this is your focal focal point. Okay, so we call this one thing back focal plan. Back focal plan. Okay, the other thing is that everyone everybody knows knows that one point source uh, emitted light from the focal point, and will go 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 for what? Parallel beam, yeah, exactly. So this is what we call FFP. It's the front focal lens. Okay, so if you, we get an image, okay, if we have an image, here's a focal point, and here's an image, and we can, oh, we have objects, sorry. We have objects, so we can get an image. This is the back focal plane. Okay, so this is the image. Okay, so we define this as the image plane. Okay, so it's simple for TM to generate the T, uh, diffraction pattern and the image. Okay, if your screen is con conjugate to the back focal plane, then you get a uh, diffraction pattern. If your screen is conjugate to an image plane, then you get the the image. So if your so here, okay, at the red point there is a you see the cross that is the back focal plane, and from that red point to the screen just the magnification of the image. Okay, so that gives you the back uh, focal plane. Uh, that gives you the diffraction pattern. But if your image generate here conjugate to your uh, screen, just to ma magnify that image by many lenses, then this gives you an image. They basically they are give you the same information of of material. Okay, so let me show you why we are talking about those things. Okay, so why is that important? If this is a crystal structure, 
Okay, here's the manganese oxide. This is a lanthanum strontium manganese oxide. I just call LSMO, and this is MMO. Okay, so here's the diffraction pattern we will see in that com composite material. Okay, there are many, many diffraction patterns. It's complicated. So if this is the... Okay, so here is diffraction I just mentioned. Oh, okay. Um, okay, this... Okay, probably we run out of time. So, so I will demonstrate how, how this works. Or basically is uh, how we can use the diffraction pattern and the dark field and black field image to tell which material in, thi in this image is uh, lithium. Is this is lithium, strontium, manganese oxide, or this is magnesium oxide? It's hard to other uh, tool to, to tell, to differentiate two. But it is very powerful that TM can differentiate, differentiate a, this two uh, by changing uh, from a diffraction pattern to the uh, image. So, okay, let's talk about that later in next time. And thank you.